Hello, Fried Fam. This week on Fried the Burnout Podcast, I get to share with you someone who's been in this world as long as I have. And the story of how he got there is A, highly relatable, and B, includes a heart attack. So you might want to take a moment today to sit with this and really feel into this story because there is a lot of opportunity for healing here. Every Fried episode is designed to give you moments to heal, to drop shame, blame, guilt, and judgment. And today you will get a pretty big dose of that. I have the absolute honor of sharing space today with Dex Randall, who coaches professionals back from burnout to heart-centered leadership so they can create better performance than they have ever experienced and support others who struggle. He helps them rekindle the passion and joy they lost, both at work and at home. Dex's background is in corporate and entrepreneurial software development with a sideline in energy healing. Y'all know I love that part. Reiki, kinesiology, EFT, and NLP. He's a deeply intuitive healer and coaches through empathy. Dex is joining us all the way from Sydney, Australia today and visits Bondi Beach before work most days to body surf, hang out, and laugh a lot with his surf club friends. Dex, welcome to the show. Wow, thanks, Kate. Delightful to be here. I'm so excited to have you. We're doing a a bit of a deep dive today, so I'm going to ask you to share your story, but take a deep breath, pause if you need to, and we'll go from there. Okay, well, I think we need to start at the end because you've already mentioned it. Yeah. I had burnout in 2017, and I had it when I was working at a startup. And my job there was CTO and my job was actually to publish the product is to get it out there into the world. And I was at odds with the, uh, with the founder because he was a little bit too scared to put it out into the world. And we had endless debate about whether I was going to be allowed to publish anything or not. And he was always like, no, let's, let's work on the investment side. Let's work on the report side and the validation side. Let's work on the it was a financial well-being mm. app and let's work on a mental health side let's recruit some doctors and it was always this and i uh, i became more and more stressed in that job because my role had always been in the past to be a producer i always got stuff out there that was my my special thing was bringing things to market <clears throat> so i had that job for about 6 months or so and i realized i was never going to be able to do my job and i got more and more and more and more stressed And that is where my burnout happened, but it had been brewing for quite a lot of years. I had a few jobs before that that had gone well, but I hadn't really felt it. Anyway, I got in this one job and I was totally stymied and uh, the stress just went stratospheric on me. And I would just turn up in total dread every morning and I would hide behind this huge monitor on my desk and hope nobody could see what I wasn't doing. And there was really only me and him. (laughs) (laughs) There was nobody else. (laughs) Anyway, we'd have meeting after meeting and I was like, oh, I can't put the suit on and go to another meeting about raising money. I can't. And um, so I said to him one day, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put this little bit out and test it in this way. And he just went, oh, no, because I've had this other idea about a report. And it was Tuesday morning. I remember it so vividly. And I just said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done because this thought went through my mind that the stress was at such a high level now that it was physically going to kill me if I didn't do something. And I quit my job on the spot. I said, that's it, it's done. I'm out. And I went home. <laughs> and I never went back. And about three weeks later is when I had the heart attack, when my body came down a little bit. Yeah. Then I, I was running on the beach in the morning and I had this whopping heart attack. Three days in intensive care heart attack. <sighs> Um, it was quite scary actually. And then I just thought, well, that's that career over then. And uh, I guess, you know, I'd seen this coming from a really long way off and I knew my career was in decline. And for the previous 10 years, I got brave enough to branch out into energy healing as a sideline because it was such a great antidote working face to face with people 
energetically with people, even a little bit of hands-on work. It's just that direct human, visceral human connection mm. was such an antidote to being analytically in my head, wrangling these stress problems all day, that I became more and more excited about that. When I had the heart attack, I couldn't do it. Yeah. Couldn't do even that because they said, well, you need to lie on a sofa for a few months and not move at all because your heart needs absolute rest. It needs to be as inactive as possible. And I was like, well, so I lay on the sofa for months and I felt like shit. I felt like I'd been hit by a truck. Yeah. It's just physically, it was so incapacitating. Yeah. I had a lot of pain, but I was also like a balloon that you've let go and all the air's gone out. It, mm. I just had nothing. And I thought, whoa, that, that was a close call. That was more than a close call. Because, well, they were angry with me because after my run, when I had this heart attack on the yeah. beach, then I went in the water thinking maybe that'll fix it. Then I went and had coffee with my friends. Oh, no. Then I went up to a swimming pool and did an interview, a video interview with a friend of mine that I'd already organized. And then I cycled home up a big hill. And then I waited a couple of hours thinking, I wonder what's wrong with me because it might be a heart attack. And by the time I rang them, the hospital because I googled all the symptoms of a heart attack by the time I rang them it will be there and I got in the ambulance and the guy said oh, and the, the two people in the ambulance their eyebrows shot around the back of their head they're like whoa have some morphine I'm like why they said well you've left it too long and when I got to the hospital they said oh another 20 minutes you'd have been dead they couldn't because you. It's only a very short window. Okay, yeah. <laughs> viewers. There's only a very short window in which you can recover from a heart attack and get help. Otherwise, your heart just holds up the red card and goes, "Yeah, I'm out." And I'd pushed the window too long. <laughs> they were mad with me. So I want everybody to just stop for a moment. I told you that this we were going to jump right into it today, and and here we are. I want you to think about ways that you are ignoring the things that your body is clearly telling you and just saying, oh, maybe I'll just get rid of gluten. Maybe I'll just, you know, still walk to my friend's house. Maybe I'll just have a glass of wine to chill out. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll, maybe I'll. The risks are bigger than you think. The risks are bigger than you think. And you said earlier, Dex, that you feel like it had been sort of building up for a really long time. Was this pre-work that was building up? Like, is this, are we talking childhood? Are we talking something happened when you were in college? Where's your mind going? Yeah, and just to your point, by the way, I was in and out of hospital for a year after that with heart yeah. problems, and then I had a car accident six months later oh, and no. was in hospital for three months altogether. So the whole recovery period was a couple of years. Yeah. So I would agree. Don't Your body is trying to help you here by telling you stuff. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, so for me, I've always had problems, basically. I've always had problems since childhood because... I grew up in a household that was unsupportive. Let me just mm. put it that way. I was very, uh, I never felt welcome in the world and I was very vulnerable in my own home mm. to my parents. And I was mm. very scared right from the very beginning, right from a baby. My parents told me once, I said, well, we couldn't understand it, but for the first year of your life, you wouldn't keep any food down. Anything we put in, you came straight back up. And I'm like, really? What was wrong? And they're like, we don't know. Hmm. But I mean, in reflection, I was bloody terrified. That's yeah. what was actually happening. And it, so for me, all my memories of childhood are rather frightening. I was basically frightened all the time, whether my parents were there or whether they weren't there. Because if they weren't there, they were going to come back unpredictably and do something unpredictable. And so I felt, I felt I was carrying a big burden. I felt I was responsible for my parents and, and their state of being, 
So this is how I became an empath. And that's why I'm such a good energy healer, because I'm so strongly aware of other people's emotions yeah. and their physical state, their bodies and emotions talk to me. Yeah. I pick things up. And because you learned to. Yeah. So I'm, I'm super aware. My antenna are like yards long. Yeah. And I, I learned this skill of detecting people's state, not just their nervous system state, but their emotional state, their physical illness, physical ailments. As a like measure I, to protect yourself. Yeah. If you could. Yeah. Yeah. Because the way that I, the only way I could be safe as a child was to disappear. Mm. I, I would just make myself as tiny and invisible and undetectable as possible. Because as soon as I was detectable, I was in trouble. But I also, my job then would be to absorb the rage. Mm. But it was, un, it was endless and I couldn't absorb it. Yeah. I couldn't fix it. As a child, you can't. No, but you think that you can. You think that there's something. You adjust to try anyway. I did. Anyway, I did. Yeah, you have to try when you're a child because it's a survival issue. But yeah. also I had, I wasn't allowed to have a voice or an mm. opinion. Mm. I wasn't allowed to have a body. I wasn't allowed to have my own emotions. I wasn't allowed to prefer or like things or be loud or excitable. And I definitely had no boundaries whatsoever. Yeah. That was right out of the question. Yeah. I was an on-demand resource to be used when people were rageful. So, yeah, I, 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 I withdrew. I basically I dissociated. That's what we would call it now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I dissociated a lot, and my escape from that when I got old enough was to get on my bike, mm. pedal away from the house, and delay it as long as possible going back home. Nobody ever asked what I was up to. Right. But I got blamed and I got humiliated a lot and I got neglected and I got, nobody took an interest in me unless it was to <clears throat> kind of wear off a bit of stress. Yeah. How do you think that that translated into burnout later? Well, it, it's an interesting question, I think. So the way I view burnout now is that it's a constellation of experiences which are coping mechanisms that we develop in childhood to compensate for whatever's going on for us. So it's yeah. based on an attachment difficulty in early life. Mm. And then we develop these coping mechanisms, like, for example, perfectionism. We're perfectionists because we weren't accepted as a human being. We had to be a human doing to get approval or attention. So we become perfectionists, overachievers to compensate for that. And all of this kind of collection of coping mechanisms that we could call the type A personality, that's how I brand it sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's a generalization, but it kind of works. It, you know, we develop all these coping mechanisms, but really what we're doing is living on our nerves entirely. We're totally dependent on external approval. We can't really find self-approval that would make it okay just to be us as we are. We can't assert our own personality we're always hyper vigilant to see what yeah. threat is coming at us next in burnout we're basically worried what other people will think about us whether we can keep our job or not you know we're always on tender hooks aren't we am i doing enough am i doing enough is this okay will they will they judge me will they dismiss me will they hate me will they this that and the other thing and we're super achievers but we're the last people to notice that so we just keep hammering we keep our foot on the gas forever. And I think what, what that results in is exhaustion at a, at, a, at a total physical level. I'm sure you've got a, a perspective on this as an acupuncturist. Yeah. Is we, we wear out every piece of our system, our yeah. minds and our bodies and our souls even. I think. Yeah. Our emotions, so, everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This uh, sort of underlying message of not enoughness I feel like underlies so many people's stories and the stories can range from I was in an extremely abusive neglective household to we were mostly okay but my brother got more attention because he was sick 
you know, like the, the range can be so vast and the result, the resulting feeling that we end up battling that gets us stuck in burnout is, will I ever be enough? Am I lovable at all? Not can I, yeah. not was I, not, but can, can I ever be lovable? If people know yeah. who I am, I used to feel like, I still feel like this sometimes. If this person really knew who I was, they would definitely not like me. It yeah. still happens. I'm 40 years old and I've been doing this work for seven years and I was an acupuncturist for 13 before that. Well, it's very hardwired in. Whatever we learn as a child as a coping mechanism is very hardwired in by the time we become an adult. Yeah. It's actually quite difficult to shake some of that stuff loose because the amygdala, like my amygdala goes off like this all day long. Yeah. Like clockwork. Yeah. Because what happened, what I discovered is in, okay, 1993, mm -hmm. I went to see a psychiatrist once only. <laughs> well, I've seen others, but this is one, one woman. I went to see her once only. She And right in the introductory conversation, she said, oh, yeah, you've got sociophobia. I'm like, the hell I have. I'm not coming back here. I was so insulted. <laughs> anyway, so I never went back. Yeah. But, I mean, she's right because my parents taught me very strongly never, ever to trust another human Anybody. being. Never. Yeah. They didn't trust each other. They didn't trust their neighbors. We lived in complete isolation within our household. Yeah. Like even to this day, my siblings and I have deep difficulty developing any kind of relationship with any kind of human. Yeah. How many of you are there? Four. Four. And do you have, have you found a way to find closeness with each other or no? No, but interestingly, we didn't even discover how to communicate with one another until all of us had left home. Yeah. Because it wasn't for me. We couldn't talk about anything in our house. Nothing real was allowed to be discussed ever. Yeah. So we couldn't discuss being, we couldn't discuss anything to do with our humanity. Yeah. So, so we had a, we, we lived in the same house, like in this bunker. In bubbles. But we didn't realize we liked each other until after we'd left home. Mm. So, yeah. And they're still uncommunicative. Like I, I will, I, we don't, and we don't discuss health, mental health, bodies, sex, families, relationships, any of those things ever. It's all white goods and jobs. Yeah. But even, you know, a couple of years ago, I think it was maybe about five, five, six years ago, I got diagnosed with CPTSD. Mm -hmm. And if you want to explain after, to people what that is, complex PTSD is the kind of PTSD is kind of trauma response you get from repetitive trauma rather than once off trauma. So complex PTSD is often a label given to people who, for example, were in the military where they've had repeated trauma in the military sense, but it's more often given to people who experience trauma they couldn't digest as children. Because repeated. that tends to be repeating trauma yeah. rather than mm -hmm. being in a house fire or a road accident. or Right. And the first responders get it a lot as well. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I didn't get, although I thought I've had this since I was a kid, I wasn't diagnosed till about well, five or six years ago, and it came as quite a shock to me. I was like, oh, okay, well, that explains a whole bunch of stuff. But why, <laughs> in that case, have I been in decades of therapy where nobody's ever mentioned this? But I think it's also worth mentioning, like, if you think about the DSM, CPTSD wasn't added to the to the DSM until 1987. Right. Because it used to be shell shock before that in the war. Yeah. But I think I'm looking back on my parents' history and their parents' history, and I'm thinking, we've got a family tree of PTSD, actually. Yeah. My parents had it. Their parents had it. Yeah. But nobody knew what it was. And because growing up, we never talked about mental health. Anyway, I kind of mentioned it to one of my sisters a couple of years ago. I said, well, you know, this is what's happening for me, thinking that, you know, she should know because maybe it's happening for her. <laughs> anyway, we had a conversation. It would have been about three sentences. Yeah. And then we're like, okay, that's that done. Yeah, and then it shuts down. So 
last week, just before this episode, I released an episode on how childhood trauma is related to burnout. Yeah. And that was based on a research paper that I did for the degree that I finished recently. And congratulations. Thank you. And so what I, I want people to consider is that if your nervous system doesn't function the way that it's supposed to because you were subject to an array of various traumas, you are not responsible for this burnout. You're not responsible for it, even if you don't feel like you had those traumas. But especially if you did, there are very significant correlations <clears throat> there are very significant correlations between the number of adverse childhood experiences and how significantly distressed your system is because of it and how significantly impacted your brain development is. So the brain development changes that happen with ACEs, with adverse childhood experiences, are very similar to the ones that happen with burnout. So I feel like we're in sort of a chicken and an egg scenario here. Are these brain changes this result of this chronic long-term stress, or is burnout happening in people that had these developmental differences from the get-go? from childhood? I don't know that we can answer that question because we don't have brain scans from every single person for every year of their lives. But it just does sort of make me sit back and think about that. Like, is it just so this is this is why maybe I'll say it like this. This is why I kind of get irritated with the burnout prevention crowd. I think burnout prevention work is necessary. I think we should be doing some organizational change. I also think that we can do all the organizational change in the world. We can fix the workplaces and make them utopias. And there are still some of us who will end up burnt out. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I would agree. And I think, yes, we really do need to do some work on psychological safety because it really makes a big difference. Because what a person with PTSD does not experience is safety. Like for me, yeah. on a moment-to-moment -moment basis each day, my safety flicks in and out. Right. I can be sitting by myself at home, not in contact with the world at all, making a cup of tea and still get into unsafety. Mm. But I think particularly with CPTSD, because it affects brain development, we, we, don't, we lose, I mean, if you read the literature on this, we lose our capacity to develop parts of our brain associated with social function, for one yeah. thing. Yep. But also some other brain development just doesn't happen when we're kids. Mm -hmm. You can't make up for that as an adult. No. You but can build on it because the brain is plastic. You can build on it. And... There are limitations. Yeah. My perception of burnout is it's an effect. Yeah. Of, of our life experiences. And therefore, people who are in burnout, I mean, I, I don't see them. I don't see anybody who is in burnout as burnout being their fault. It's just an experience they're having that we can work skillfully with to help to help them you know have a better experience and i it's also my view that burnout can be permanently remedied like for me burnout was a consequence of my cptsd right and various other mishaps i've had in my life but i won't even though i haven't got rid of ptsd i do have no burnout now I don't, I don't expect to ever go back into burnout again. 
that's a really important distinction. Can you dig into that a little bit deeper? Because I think there are some people that feel like, you know, once they're in it, they're stuck for good. And somebody just wrote in the Facebook group recently for the podcast also, like, you know, you're always going to be recovering. And I don't, I don't really agree or disagree with that. I am fully recovered from burnout. And I know that if things go haywire in my life and my normal stress responses, my encoded lifelong stress responses come back and those coping mechanisms come back, I can lean towards burnout really easily. And I feel aware enough of myself that I'm not afraid of that. So I, I feel like to me, being recovered from burnout means losing the fear that it will happen to me. Per that's a personal thing. I don't necessarily think that for my clients because I allow that to define them. I allow them to define that for themselves. But that that it, that's it for me. Like, could I burn out again? Yeah, pr I could because I have still some of those tendencies. I'm not perfect. I haven't eliminated every stressor in my life or stopped every coping mechanism. And yet, yeah. I have no fear that I'm going to be there again. And that resonates for me. I don't have any fear that I'll go back into burnout. Mm -hmm. But when I see the warning signs, I know how to help myself. Right. What are your so warning I... signs? Overwork, rumination, mm. anxiety that I'm not getting enough done. Mm. Specifically but about I, anxiety about getting things done, specifically that. Yes, because I think there's a people pleasing element. There's a like in childhood, I had to fix the problem that my parents had, but I didn't, they wouldn't explain it to me or tell me what it right. was, but I nonetheless had to fix it. As a child, I wasn't capable of doing that, but that was always the message. You've got to make things okay for me. I'm having an, I'm having an emotion I can't deal with. You've got to fix it, but yeah. I never could. So I think that. I'm very attuned to people's emotional landscape. And I think there's a piece of me that still thinks I can only survive by fixing every problem. And that mm. is a driver for being in burnout. And that's why I had the burnout when I realized for sure I couldn't fix the problem I was in. Right. At work. But that driver is still in me. Right. To fix people's emotions. I can still feel very, I'm, I'm my antenna for, other people's nervous energy is so wild that I have difficulty going to a supermarket. Mm. Because now at a societal level, the yeah. anxiety is so far escalated from what it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. What do you do? Being in a public space, people's, people's nervous energy I find overwhelming. Yeah, so what do you do? Well, last week I heard somebody who's on the autism spectrum talking about wearing headphones mm -hmm. to block out some of the mm -hmm. sensory information, which in this mm -hmm. case is sound. So I have a real big problem with sound. Mm. So, I, so I tried that and that actually is quite good. I can wear headphones at the supermarket and everything's suddenly workable again. I feel like an idiot. <laughs> that's not who cares <laughs> yeah big, those big ear covering you know, yeah noise cancelling yeah. giant ear covering headphones because i find if i if i'm sitting down for a coffee with friends if there are two or three conversations going at once i can't detach from any of them my poor little brain is trying to listen to all three mm -hmm. but it can't it can't do that it can't actually interpret what three sets of people are saying mm -hmm. and it just goes <laughs> Yeah, I can't, I don't like to go to dinner with more than, if it's my husband and I, two other people at a time, like four people total, because that typically stays in either one or two conversations maximum. And as soon as there's more people, it can be more conversations and I can't handle it. I My brain just, so, it can't uh, cope because, no. in, but when the amygdala is triggered, so this is coming from Bonnie Badenoch, who wrote a very, very good book, The Heart of Trauma. Maybe you know mm. it. I don't. She talks actually. about all the physicality, the, you know, the physiology of trauma yeah. and how it affects the body because it's pretty profound. And one thing is there's a little bone in your ear and it shifts position when your amygdala is triggered huh. because the survival mechanism, when you're being chased by a tiger, you do not need to have social conversation 
So this little bone in your ear makes it so you can't interpret social conversation. It tunes out the human voice and it renders it background noise. So because there's you and the tiger, right? So you don't need to worry what somebody's had for lunch. And so when this thing goes off, I can be around people and I can see their mouths moving and I can hear that sound is coming out of their face, but I can't understand the words. So when there's three sets of that, it's okay, I'm out. That's fascinating. I've never heard that before. And I think that that is just, I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. Well, it does really. Who needs social con- who needs social conversation when the tiger's coming? But this is back to to childhood survival, right? Right. So your social your social side doesn't develop. I actually didn't discover the basics of human con- communication and how that worked at a social level until after I left home. <laughs> I don't think I learned it for the intake portion of it until I burnt out. I was very good at social connection for other people. <laughs> I was the friend that showed up. I was the friend that listened. I was the yeah. person that people went to. I was the helper. I was the giver. I was the, I was the, I was the, so I was good at it sort of, except for I couldn't take any of it in from other people. I wasn't, I didn't need, I didn't ask my friends for anything. Yeah. I don't need anything from anybody. Don't you even dare try to help me. Don't insult me by trying to help me as if I would need help. Yeah. It's wild, isn't it? It is wild. But it's also a very self-defeating thing. Like I have difficulty in allowing anybody anywhere near me in a personal context or to get to know anything about me because that's just like too risky altogether. But the way I learned to deal with that as a kid is just to be brutal to people. Right. It's just to really slice and dice a little bit. This is what my parents taught me is brutal on a level that I can't even imagine now. Yeah. I wrote friendly letters to my sister when I went away one time. She was in a different country from me and I wrote letters. I would have been late teens. And all of my letters start with something really, really abusive if you look at it now as an adult. But in retrospect, that's how how I was approaching her in a friendly way. That's how we related. And we thought that was how everybody related because we didn't have a different model. Yeah. Would you have considered yourself a bully in school? I was. I was probably both a bully. Well, I wasn't a bully at school because I didn't talk to anyone at school, but Mm. at home I was as a small, as a youngster. Yeah. I was a bully with my sisters. Yeah. Because I had all this n- nervous yeah. energy and rage and I didn't know what to do with it all. Yeah. And I was the one who copped it every time. Right. It was always me. When you So I was then, but then I when I got in my late teens, somebody pointed this behavior out to me and I'm like, oh no, that's terrible. Yeah. And I stopped. When you had your heart attack and then you were laid out for months. I I can imagine that, and maybe this is an assumption of mine, and if I'm incorrect, tell me. I can imagine that you learned over time that exercise helped to move some of the rage. So the running and the cycling and the, was a, it was medicine to a certain degree. Rugby, even better. Squash or something. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Something, right. So exercise, something really helped for that. So when you were laid up with a heart attack did you have more rage again because you didn't have the ability to move in a way that was helpful good question but no I actually realized as soon as I had the heart attack I thought this is a learning for me in this Mm. and I accepted it and I accepted the situation and I didn't feel rage I just felt oh I need to change tack here I need to redirect myself because what I've been doing isn't working. This is my warning shot. I'm probably not going to get two. I need to redirect. So I didn't actually go into rage. I acknowledged I had to go inside myself and find something deeper. Do you think that that came from the sort of sideline into the energy work that had been sort of 
becoming more and more part of your life as time went on? Well, probably, but I'd also been studying Buddhism for quite a long time and I'd done okay. a lot of meditation, so I was fairly in touch with my own experience. Yeah. But also I'm a big believer that the universe sends you what you need. So particularly when I had the heart attack and I was convalescing for six months, then I got hit by a car and I was stuck in hospital for a few more months. I thought, oh, I didn't get the message the first time. I've got another one. Because I couldn't move. I was I was 100% bed bound for eight weeks. Couldn't sit up or do anything. I was all smashed up. And I thought, oh, I didn't get the message the first time. Now I'm getting the message again. So it was clear. When was it that on this journey that you were like, oh, this is burnout and then started some sort of recovery journey? Or did you go through some of a recovery journey before you even knew what it was? Like, when did burn, like now you work with burnout. Like this is what you, you coach other burnout coaches. What is the, how did that happen? Well, I don't know if you've ever met a type A man, but we're not the kind to put a hand up and go, hey, I need help. I got a bit of a problem. It's kind of embarrassing. So I think I knew I was going into burnout for quite a few. Uh, oh, okay. So really it goes back to in 2011, my coping mechanism at that time, I was self-employed, working from home, hardly ever left my own home. And I, I, I was drinking too much and I, it got a bit out of control and I stopped drinking in 2011. And when I stopped drinking, the shit really hit the fan. Mm. I was like, oh, God, that was my interface to the world out the window and now I've got to rebuild with nothing. And I think I knew then that I was on a sticky wicket, you know, that things weren't working out, that I'd withdrawn from the world almost completely. In a few years ago here in Australia, there was a royal commission into child into institutional child sexual abuse. And it went for a couple of years and it was in the news a lot and it was all kinds of institutions were covered. Anyway, I watched a guy once who was about my age. He was on the TV talking about his CPTSD as a result of this childhood abuse. And uh, he said, well, I live alone and... I can't hold down a job and I don't have any friends because I can't form human relationships. I just live every day trying to manage my level of unsafety and my symptoms. I just try and get through the day. And I thought, hmm, is that what CPTSD is? Because I feel a lot the same. That's how I'm living. I'm just trying to manage my symptoms every day and cut out all the too difficult bits like people. (laughs) And I've lived, I've lived and worked alone now for i don't know about 15 years yeah and i just keep trying to re-enter the world and it keeps being too much for me and it's like mm. so i think i knew from particularly when i gave up drinking which was my buffer zone against the world this is alcohol was a social lubricant for me it enabled me to be around people with the mm-hmm. my senses were a bit dimmed mm-hmm. and i didn't go into so much overwhelm with sound and people and light and yeah I had the same no I just tamped everything down a bit so when that went I was like oh I'm in deep shit now Mm -hmm. I am in deep shit and that's when I withdrew from the world because I just thought well that was my social interface gone what's left and then when did you decide to start working with burnout well well I was already doing the energy healing and meditation stuff so I It's been, it was coming for about 25 years. I always wanted to work with people, but I was so messy myself. I didn't go there. I was like, I'll be ready soon. I'll be ready soon. So 25 years I worked on this, but then when (laughs) I had my own burnout, it's like, okay, it's time. Yeah. It's time because a lot of people are suffering out there. A lot of people aren't getting the help they need. A lot of people don't understand what's happening and are pretty scared. Yeah. So I thought I'm going to work with men in burnout because they're the last people in the world to ask for help. Yeah, I know how to help them because I found some methods that work for me. And I thought I'm a hard case. If it works for me, it works for everybody else too. Yeah. And it does. What do you think? This is a sort of a bone that I have to pick with the sort of stress world in general. Women as a general rule are allowed to say, you know, we have more mental load. We do more work in the house. We're still working full time. We mm. have it harder than you. You're a white man. What are you complaining about? Kind of thing, you know? And I think that this is incredibly harmful, 
and we've talked about this on the podcast before, because it just makes the men who are suffering suffer harder and suffer lonelier. So what mm. do you think men need to hear in order to say, you know what, I'm not okay and I need to do something? Or does something need to happen? Such a good question. And I do think that women and men experience perfectly valid experiences of burnout, but different than one another. So women are socialized to behave and expect different things than men, as you point out. I broadly agree with you. I think what men in burnout, the message that I would extend to them is that they are wonderful, well-intentioned, big-hearted human beings who are suffering intensely for reasons beyond their control. And that is no problem. The best thing that they can do if they want to be functional again and support their family and be a good work, if they want to do that again, reaching out for help is such a, is such a strength. This is what the really courageous men will do. They'll go, I'm in a pickle. Actually, I do need a bit of help. Can you help me? Because as soon as that, as soon as they open that door, that is the doorway to returning to being the kind of man that they can back. It's, yeah. it's the doorway back to admiring themselves and functioning again and being the support they think they need to be for everybody around them, especially their families. I don't yeah. think of it as a weakness. I think it's a very powerful choice. I agree. To be I a agree. full human again. The first thing that you said had, had me in tears just a reminder that you're a fully hearted, fully empathetic, fully living, fully experiential human, just like anybody else. And if you're suffering, you don't need to be. No, I mean, it'd be a bit like having some extremely debilitating disease and having to carry on without mentioning it. Yeah. What are it's the in a way because I sometimes think about well if somebody has cancer you wouldn't blame them for having cancer oh, some people do it <laughs> can be stigmatized depends on the cancer there's that can that can get that can get sticky too like you know somebody has lung cancer but they smoked they get right, blamed yeah, right but they, they had a coping smoking was a coping mechanism of and course. I don't think you can blame people for having coping mechanisms neither do I them. But the world still will throw shade at you for all sorts of stuff. The most important thing here is, I think, it doesn't matter that the world might throw shade at you because they're not living your life. And only you know what it is you need and where you're going. And if you need the help, go get it. You said that there are some things that you learned and that you do that you know are effective. Are there one or two things that you can share with people? Say there's a man listening to this right now and he's like, holy shit, this is my story. What What's step one? Step one for me was finding myself good enough. I have to realize I'm a valuable and worthy human being before I'm going to do anything about the experiences of burnout mm. from a kind of clean and supportive and kind place. Cause otherwise I'm just going to see myself in burnout and ramp up my inner critic, put my inner critic on steroids and let it go at me. And that's never going to help. <laughs> so I do, I made an agreement with myself that I'm a human being, not a human doing for one thing. And that if I perceive I failed at something, it's fine. I just tried something. It didn't work in this moment. I agree that I'm a good human being and my conditions for agreeing that I'm a good human being are only two. One is, do I have a good heart? Mm. Which I do. And I'm exploring it more and more these days, letting it out more and more. And that's why I love coaching. And the other condition is, am I basically well-intentioned? Mm. And if I meet those two conditions, which for me, I always do good enough. What happens in the outside world is less important than that. So I've got a deep love for people, really. I love coaching. I love working with people. There's nothing wrong with my heart, apart from the heart attack. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with the quality of love that I'm capable of. In my, in my, where was it? In my 40s, my early 40s, 
had a social chat with somebody who was a new psychotherapist and she said, oh, you're incapable of love. Oh. And I just went, uh, I was like, this is just a social chat. We were in the park walking and this came out of her and I was like, and that's not true. And all of the people I meet in my work in burnout are big hearted, well-intentioned, loving, caring, you know, really conscientious, contributing. They're marvelous people, all of them. And I will never doubt them. Yeah. They're just a bit nobbled by circumstances and the corner they've <laughs> painted themselves in with their coping mechanisms and we just open the gate and let them out. So step one is find your worth. Understand your worth. Agree. Agree. You're worthy. Okay. Find agree. a way to agree that you're worthy. Find mm. your contact with this good heart. Every person's heart has enough love in it. See if you can make contact with yourself and your own love. Because love at the end of the day is all, it, it's all we've got. I mean, there's only two energies, love and fear. You're in a lot of fear now. So let's just flip the thing and look for the love, which is still inside you, still there. And then what's the step after that? Well, then we deal with the symptoms of burnout. Mm. particularly the anxiety, the fear, worry about self-criticism, perfectionism, people-pleasing. We just knock off all of the different symptoms, if you like, or signs of burnout. I teach people tools to overcome all of those things individually. And then it brings them back to buoyancy and energy and, they, you know, they start to get a bit of animation back in. Is there a tool for one of those things that's a, like sort of quick and dirty, easy to learn? Well, my first thing that I that I like to share is to teach people to write down 10 things they appreciate about themselves. Because we, what we've got is we've got a barometer that's in stormy all the time, right? This inner critic is absolutely on fire all day long, mm. slamming us. So we need to bring the barometer out the other way into sunny. So I, the way I encourage people to do this is to get in contact with their fundamental assets, what's good about them. I say, okay, write down 10 things you appreciate about yourself every day. Anything, anything counts. There's no rules, but it needs to be 10 different things every day and you do it for a month. And when you do that, at the end of the month, you've got 300 things you appreciate about yourself. It shows you in black and white that there's something left that's good about you. It encourages you to contact this inner validity, if you like, as a human mm -hmm. being. And it just opens the door to, oh, yeah, not everything about me sucks. <laughs> Failing at every at everything. Even though it looks like that, because a lot of people come to me, they have a great deal of family stress as well as work stress. Yeah. When your work falls apart, when your relationships at work, when you've got a lot of fear at work, in your home life, there's going to be a great deal of friction in your relationships too. A lot of people come to me and they've got marital problems yeah. with their kids. Their social life has gone because the two things are inseparable. So when we, are, when I help people come out of burnout, all their other relationships improve out of hand as well, and they start enjoying those, which I think is so fun. It's the core of it, really. Yeah. Well, how do we sum up? I think we start with, if you are wondering about your own childhood experiences and you haven't listened to last week's episode, pop back and listen to that one and it will help put this one into more context. And if you're thinking about that and worrying about that, the chances are that there's a reason. And those reasons and those experiences do not eliminate you from the possibility of healing from burnout. And I think that that's super important. If there was, if there's 400 men listening to this today, 
What's your last message to them? You're already worthy. You're Amen. already a good man. It's already happening inside. Just need to scrape away some of the surface stress. And that is, burnout is fixable. I don't care who you are, really. I never really met anybody who wasn't able to come through a burnout experience. I think that's but a I think we need a kind of help that is maybe not just taking a couple of weeks off and hoping it's going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard I haven't had that work for too many people. <laughs> no, me either. So a lot of the topical application of these fixes in in the world at large, yeah. they're band-aids. And what what I deal with in burnout, and I'm sure you do as well, is let's tackle the root of the problem, not the symptom of the problem. Yes, we reduce symptoms. Of course. But as well at the same time, we need to see what the fundamental difficulties are that are spawning these behaviors help yeah. us incubate our own burnout, if you like. So I think Dex, sticking something on the outside isn't going to really help. Exactly. Dex, if there are people out there that are like, well, I need to work with him starting yesterday, where do they find you? DexRandall.com. Easy. Super easy. And we'll be, as per usual, in the show notes. Dex, I appreciate your willingness to come on and tell this story because I also believe that part of the challenges that men face is that we don't invite them to be vulnerable enough. We don't create enough space for that to happen. And when somebody does that for, by example, when somebody models that for other people, I believe that that offers a huge degree of healing opportunity. So I'm really grateful for your ability to show up for us today and, and show up in this way. So thank you so much for your voice today. Super, because I think this mask of invincibility that we have to wear needs to go. Not Absolutely. Helping. Fried fam, we are at the end of season six. We have a couple of weeks break and then we come back with season seven. And I cannot wait to share with you what's coming up next. Fried will still be here for you. Fried is coming back stronger than ever. Fried wants to be shared and loved around the world. So if you're listening to this episode and one, two, three, or 12 people popped into your mind, please get the link and send it to them. Because if you think that they need it and they actually take the time to listen, it might really change their lives. So I encourage you to share this with everyone who you think could have a moment of healing from its truth. Thank you so much, and I'll talk to you soon.